there. Okay, I think this is where we left off. I had to go back, <clears throat> excuse me, a couple of weeks um, prior since we sort of sidetracked ourselves on the talk of angels and so forth. So I uh, wanted to catch us back up where we're at. With that, um, I think we will go ahead and begin with a word of prayer. Let us pray. Gracious Lord, Heavenly Father, we give you thanks today for the gift of your word, uh, a word that calls us to repentance, a word that calls us uh, into a way of living, Lord, that is different than the way of the world. And so, Lord, we hear, uh, hear our thanks. Um, continue to guide us with that word, Lord, even as we endeavor to study today to learn about our existence with you. It's in the name of Jesus who's made this existence possible that we pray. Amen. Okay, so um, this is a point in... Hopefully by now, some of this, because we have natural overlap in some of these conversations, um, we're at a point where we're going to be talking about some things that we have already talked about because we're talking about what we as Lutherans believe, which is on the basis of Scripture. Um, this is a point that could have been made in church this morning. Those of you that were already in worship, you heard, us, heard me talking about some of this, but um, uh, I had this conversation with someone this last week, and I can't remember what the context of that conversation was in the moment, but uh, it was about um, doctrine versus practice. And um, what we believe in the Lutheran Church is that doctrine always stands superior to practice or precedes our practice. That is, our practice should always be shaped by our doctrine first. Okay, so doctrine is derived from the scriptures. Um, I'll throw my mother-in-law under the bus because she's not here, nor are my family because my brother-in-law and his family are here with him, and I know they're all trying to compete for showers at the house. Um, I hope they are anyway. But my mother-in-law years ago said to me one time, she says, doctrine is man-made, scripture is God-given. And I said, well, where do you think doctrine comes from? Doctrine is derived from the scriptures. So doctrine is God-given, and if doctrine is God-given through his word, then our practice should be derived from the doctrine that's found in the scriptures, not the other way around. Was it men's Bible class that we were doing, or men's Bible breakfast? Yeah, okay, sorry for the repeat on that for you guys. Sorry, not sorry. Um, some of you guys really need it. <laughs> that's the elephant in the room, but, um, but an elephant never forgets. Uh, if practice informs doctrine, you get it backwards, okay? So, and uh, the examples that I gave of this, the very easy examples, and it fits neatly in with the conversation with the reading from 1 Timothy 2 today, would be one of the ministry, for instance, okay? Uh, do we have women ministers in the Missouri Synod Lutheran Church? No. Do they have them in the ELCA church? Yes. Why? <laughs> I don't know. <laughs> I'm not trying to just shoot arrows or anything like this. I'm just pointing out a fact, okay? Why are there women ministers in the ELCA? For several reasons, okay? The main reason dates back to the 1970s when they changed their view of Scripture, and that became a splitting point between the LCMS and the ELCA. The LCMS stuck with the veracity of Scripture being the inspired, inerrant Word of God, Okay? And it, they called it the battle for the Bible. And it happened on Concordia Seminary campus in St. Louis, where I graduated from. Students walked out because students and faculty alike were looking at the Bible as though it contained God's word, but it was not necessarily the inspired and errant word of God. Well, not a lot of people in the churches out in the, in the world, out in the field, knew that that's what was kind of going on. Um, it wasn't until some of the practicalities of that decision that happened back in the 70s started to trickle out into the churches that people started to take notice. Um, about 10 years ago, we started a mission congregation in Aurora, Nebraska, myself and 11 charter members. And um, we'd been underway working for a couple of years at one point, when, and the big church in town was, um, was a big Lutheran ELCA church in Aurora, Nebraska. Well, suddenly we got this massive influx of people coming in because um, all these people kept telling me when I would sit down and visit with them, they'd say, well, we can't stand what's going on in the ELCA church anymore. Well, what's that? Well, they have, you know, gay bishops that they're ordaining, 
homosexual bishops in the church, homosexual ministers. Um, and I said, well, you know, it's, I wasn't, I didn't say this to them, but I thought it was sort of striking that um, the problem, the source of the problem was that they had walked away from the veracity of Scripture. Well, it's no wonder then that the, the practice that's derived from Scriptures is corrupted also then. So what's their view? Their view was they took a historical critical view of the Scripture, which is to say that the, the Bible contains the Word of God, but there are other things in there that were not really the Word of God. So if it only contains the Word of God, then the natural outflows of that would be things like the book of Jonah was not a really a real event that happened. A man didn't really get swallowed by a fish. That was actually just a moral lesson, a moral tale like an Aesop's fable, right? So Aesop's fable, if, if you think of some of those, you think of like the tortoise and the hare is the example that I use. Well, you know, you've heard the story of the tortoise and the hare. And what's the moral of the story of the tortoise and the hare? Slow and steady wins the race, right? Where the, the hare goes and lays down, takes a nap, and the tortoise just keeps moving along and finally finishes the race. Well, that's what they would say that, the stories in the Bible are not necessarily truth stories that happened historically and they were God-given, God-inspired events like the story of, of um, I said Job, I meant um, Jonah and the whale. Sorry, I'm, blah, 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 blah. I'm just yapping like that and it just all starts to come out. Um, but we believe that Jonah was a real man, that he was really instructed by God to go to Nineveh and um, to preach uh, a word of repentance to the people of Nineveh. And even, it's striking if you guys knew this, there's only one prophet from the Old Testament that Jesus names by name, Jonah. And it's when the Jews are demanding signs from Jesus. You prove to us, you know, by showing us a sign, do us a magic trick, Jesus. And Jesus says to the Pharisees and the scribes, he says, no sign will be given to you except the sign of Jonah. I mean, Jesus cites from Jonah. For just as Jonah was in the belly of the whale three days, so also the Son of Man will be in the belly of the earth three days, Jesus said. So, so we believe Jonah was a real guy. Um, another thing, and I don't want, I'm not trying to bring up other controversial issues, but there's, there's scads of them as you start to encounter the Scriptures. Another one would be um, creation. You know, that we can, when this is not the inspired and errant Word of God, we can throw out a six-day creation where on the seventh day God rested. And the word in Hebrew is a yom. On the, there was the evening and morning, the first yom, day, 24-hour day. It's still the same word that gets used today in Hebrew for a 24-hour day, which is yom. Okay, And that's what's written in the scriptures, in the Hebrew scriptures. So we believe that God created the heavens and the earth in a six-day period. We take the Bible literally on that point. What if you reject the Bible as inspired and errant word of God, you can do theistic evolution, which is to say, well, with God, a day is like a thousand years and a thousand years is like a day, which is, by the way, to take those two passages, 2 Peter 3, 8 and Psalm 90, verse 3, out of their context to make them say what you want them to say. That is putting practice or reason in superior position over Scripture. We talk in terms of um, magisterial. What's it mean to be magisterial or ministerial? Magisterial means, I, I, I bring that up because we've been hearing all this stuff about the queen and now the prince uh, Charles is now king. Magisterial is to be your majesty, your highness, Okay. When we talk about reason, when we apply it to the scriptures, reason should always be used ministerially, that is, in service to the scriptures and standing beneath the word of God. So when we apply reason to the scriptures, we would use our reason ministerially or only in service to the word of God. Where you go wrong is when you use your reason magisterially and you look at the word of God and you go, Oh, well, I think this about that word of God, or I think that about the word of God. No, our job when it comes to the word of God is only to receive it. We, we stand ministerially or in service to the word of God. 
So we don't get to just make up our mind and say, well, this is what I think the Word of God says, which you may then say, how do we ever do interpretive work on the Scriptures then? And you guys know our motto in the LCMS when it comes to interpreting Scripture? Scripture interprets Scripture. So to give you a for instance, when it comes to the epistle lesson today with women and their role in the church where Paul says, I do not permit a woman to exercise authority over a man. He's referring to something that is recounted time and time and time again in the scriptures, which is that order of creation that God built into creation, where the man is the head of the woman, just like Christ is the head of his bride, the church. And the woman is in submission to her man who is given to be her authority over her. That's the way God built it. And um, so we know that because we see it even in the actual act of creation. We see when we take things out of order, like in Genesis chapter 3, where who does the serpent go to? The serpent doesn't go to the man so that the man can make the determination with the woman, this is wrong. He goes to the woman. He goes out of order. Now, it's not to let the man off the hook, by the way. The man was there and gave his assent to the eating of the fruit that God had commanded the, the man and the woman not to eat. So they're both equally guilty, okay? Um, and I'm off track, and I'm sort of talking randomly up here. <laughs> but back to the case at hand. Um, the two churches divided over, is this or is this not the Bible? So at the mission congregation, we had all kinds of people coming over and saying, well, we just couldn't take it anymore what we were seeing going on in our church. And I'm like, well, isn't that curious? Because 30, 40 years ago, that's when the source problem happened and it took the symptoms of that source problem to finally drive you out of there. That's not to say that I don't believe there are faithful people in ELCA churches or other churches who don't worship or understand the scriptures as we do in the Lutheran Church Missouri Synod. We believe the scriptures to be God's inspired, inerrant word, and we, we interpret and understand the scriptures and use our reason ministerially in approaching them. And I would call us a very conservative church body, which is why we look at the scriptures and we say, you know, can a woman be a pastor in a church? That would be to take a practical problem and say, hey, there aren't many men that are becoming pastors anymore. Not a lot of guys going into the ministry. Tuesday of this week, I got an email from the now um, Associate Provost of Student Enrollment at Concordia Seminary in St. Louis, a job for which I was his predecessor um, uh, applicant and interviewee. But he's sending it out, and um, the projections when I was interviewing for the position for the next 10 years at Concordia Seminary St. Louis and Concordia Theological Seminary was they were expecting about 42 students a year would apply to become pastors. We have just over 6,000 churches. It was 6,600 churches when I graduated in the Missouri Synod. And um, they were running at about a 12% vacancy rate. And um, with, uh, with, at the time when I graduated, they were expecting with retirements that we would, we would be facing a shortage of a minimum of 250 pastors a year. It's actually worse than that. So they had 33 students apply to Concordia Seminary, get accepted, and start school this year. And um, so the plea went out. He sent out an email. I'm thankful it's not me doing his job, <laughs> even though I interviewed for it. Um, the plea went out. If you know somebody that's interested in the ministry, please refer him to us. We want to fill the classrooms. We want to have more coming to the church. Well, if we've got a pastor shortage, what's the natural thing to do when you've got a pastor shortage? And you've got people that are willing to serve that aren't men but are women. Well, let's let women be pastors. They want to do it, right? We have a need for it, right? And in a lot of cases, a woman might make a better pastor than a man because she might be more caring, more nurturing. She could be smarter than, a, than some of us. <laughs> no, yeah, could be. I know. I have a choice of words. See? Proof positive. She is. <laughs> Uh, one of my classmates at seminary, she was a deaconess student, Ruth McDonald. She was an ace in Hebrew. She aced her qualifier in Hebrew. She's got her doctorate now and is working for the church, but she's not going to be a pastor. Very smart woman, knows Hebrew, but she's not going to be a pastor because that's not what our church teaches because we hold to the pastoral epistles, right? 
1 Timothy 3, the one who desires the office of overseer desires a noble task. He must be the husband of one wife. He must manage his household well. He must not be a lover of money or a lover of too much wine, right? It goes on and there's qualifications, but all through 1 Timothy 3, it says he, 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 he. Who was Paul? Was Paul laughing? He, 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 he. No. Who was Paul talking about should fulfill that office of ministry? A man. So instead of challenging that and going, well, we don't care what God's word says, that would put us in a magisterial use of reason over and above God's word to say, doesn't matter what it says. We would say, even if it causes us as a church to suffer, to suffer a shortfall of pastors, to suffer a vacuum or a void of male leadership in the church, we will endure that. Why? Because we believe that's what it means to be faithful. And we still trust our God that he promises to supply us and care for our needs, right? Why did I get onto all that? Because it also matters when it comes to talk of death. And again, we take God's word and we use our reason ministerially or in service to those passages that speak about death and that interim time. And we receive from God what it says. We don't put our reason or our knowledge um, in a magisterial standing over God's word and saying, well, I know what God's word says, but that was written by ancient people who really don't know anything. That's, that's applying historical critical method. Yeah. That is a brilliant, did you hear that? <laughs> Let's take note. That is a brilliant connection that I did not make. <laughs> I'm giving all credit to you. But that is exactly the problem, is Satan's MO is always, did God really say this? So to call that into question, did God really say it, puts you in the position of magisterial reason over God's word instead of being in service to God's word and only receiving from God. And that's actually part of the man-woman relationship in the order of creation, right? If you look at um, when God commanded Adam not to eat the fruit of the tree, it was before Eve had even been created, before the woman had even been created. Well, then when Satan approaches the woman and he goes outside of God's order, he goes against God's order, which is always the arrow coming down, right? He goes against God's order, and he says, no, let's go to the woman. And then the woman goes to the man, and we all know that the woman can turn the man's head <laughs> and get him to do what she wants him to do. So she says, mm, the fruit of the tree looks good for eating and uh, desirable for knowledge. Let's do it. And he goes, all right. <laughs> and and um, forgetting what God says altogether, did God really say? He did say that. And, and the man should have remembered that this is how God said it. So we do the same thing when it comes to any of the doctrines that we derive from scripture. So back to my mother-in-law and her comment, you know, doctrine is, is man-made scripture is God given. Well, where do you think doctrine came from? It came from the scriptures. So doctrine is God given and doctrine always informs our practice, not the other way around. So back to finish that example, if we had a shortage of men in the office of ministry, well, the practical way to answer that question would be, let's put women in the ministry because we need people doing this. And it only makes sense, right? But that would be to say we're letting our practice now inform our doctrine and not the other way around. Our practice now says, well, we should do this. And you can do that in a whole host of things in the church. Did I answer your sort of statement, comment? No, I, I think that's a brilliant observation. And um, I appreciate that you bring it up because it's, uh, it's another nice way to fit all this stuff together. Does this make sense? All right, that's a good starting point <laughs> to get into our stuff here. So death is the unnatural separation of body and soul. I've, I've talked about this. I've drawn the pictures on the board where God created us back at the beginning, body and soul together to be unified. We're the last thing that God created as the man and the woman. And I mentioned this in the sermon this morning. God said after each of the things that he had created in each of the days of creation, and it was good, Right? But then after creating the man and the woman, after putting the, the whipped cream on top of the ice cream, on top of the nuts, on top of the chocolate sauce, he puts the cherry on the top of it, and that's the creation of the man and the woman. 
that he takes from the man's side, and he says, now this is tov ma'od, it's exceedingly good. This is the best of the best. And as I finished our class last time, I told you that even man and woman are higher on the order, higher in the chain than even the angels, right? Because the angels were just created, not body and soul. They're created a different type of a being for the purpose of serving and being messengers and doing things for God. We, man and woman, are created in the image of God. Now, a lot of churches would hear us say something like that or hear me say something like that and go, whoa, 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 whoa. We're not that great. That's really anthropocentric. Like, you really think that man holds this high of a position in God's eyes? And I would say, absolutely, because the scriptures say they do. We bear the image of God. We are the top of the chain. We are, and everything in all creation comes after us. Paul affirms this in Romans chapter 8. When he says, when the curse was leveled against man and woman, the rest of creation fell into suffering and burdened by the weight of man's sin and what it does to affect creation. And, and I'll remind you folks, um, we were reminded of it just yesterday because we went down to Cotter Spring. I told you my in-laws are in town, my brother-in-law and his family. In the morning, we drove down to Cotter Springs and we went walking on the trail for a little bit with everybody and then standing in the springs. But on the drive over, we had to take two vans and I was in the lead van so I could show them the way. And I ran over a squirrel over by the campground. He shot out in front of me and then he went, and I went, and, uh, you know, usually they tell you, hit the animal. Like, <laughs> I do it all the time. <laughs> so not that I'm happy or proud that I did this, but I'm telling you this because the squirrel is part of God's creation. And, um, it breaks my heart that it happened. I didn't even see him because, you know, you're driving through the trees and you get the sun and then the shadow and the sun and the shadow. I didn't even see him. My brother-in-law saw him and I heard a little bump under the tire and he goes, that was a squirrel. Well, then we got to the, we got to the Oktoberfest over here and my sister-in-law, finally later in the day, she comes up and she goes, I saw you hit that squirrel. <laughs> I feel bad enough about it, right? But they tell you not to swerve, just drive, they say, because it's not worth getting into an accident. But do you think the squirrel likes to be hit by a car? No. No, creation suffers. A squirrel wasn't created to die, right? It was created to eat your bird seed. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> well, we've talked about this too. When I lived in St. Louis at seminary, the squirrels would always crawl up in your engine and chew all the wiring. We had this conversation in men's Bible study too. They'd chew all the wires out of the inside of your vehicles and do lots of damage. So... But it's creation run amok after God leveled the curse against creation. And even the animals, the land suffers under the curse. So remember back in biblical times, what happened if you were farming the ground? You'd farm it for a couple of seasons and then there would be a rest. You'd give it a rest. Now what do we do with farming? I know we're not in an agrarian area here right now, but now what we do is we pour chemicals on the land. And we force the land into submission under us. And we even can try and force multiple crop cycles in a single year because 1.3% of the world's population is feeding the rest of the world. And we have to do it. And the land suffers. That might sound weird, but the land suffers under this burden that it was never intended to have to carry. So when Paul writes in Romans chapter 8 about the whole creation waits with eager longing for the revealing of the sons of God. What it's talking about is creation is waiting for the time when man and woman are raised from the dead and Christ returns and calls us back to living body and soul. Because in the day that the sons of God are revealed, that's when the curse is finally lifted in completion. Right? We're waiting Creation is waiting. The animals, the land, the, the sky. Look at space. How much space junk is floating around our planet right now? Because we keep launching stuff up there and it blows up and then it just floats and orbits around our, and then we have to monitor it so that you can be, I mean, even the space around our world is filled with junk. You guys probably don't watch these movies, 
but I have kids that have been little only recently, and my wife and I worked at Walt Disney World. But anybody see the movie WALL-E, the Disney movie? Great movie. It's a great movie, and I love it because, like, the earth just keeps piling up with junk until they finally determine, we got to leave this place because we've ruined it. Do you know there are people in the world that think this is where we're going? Elon Musk. we got to populate Mars. we got to think about getting to another planet because we've about ruined this one. I mean, will it come to that? I don't think so because the scriptures don't reveal it like that. But creation is waiting with eager longing, with eager anticipation for the revelation of the sons of God. For the whole creation was subjected to futility, not of its own will, but of the will of the one who subjected it, in hope that the creation would be set free from its bondage to decay and obtain the freedom of the glory of the children of God. In this hope, you were saved. So what's Paul saying there? He's saying the man and the woman at the, at the top of the pinnacle of the um, creation, they suffer, everything suffers. But when they are redeemed, everything is redeemed. And everything enjoys the fruits of that redemption in the day that Christ returns and restores all things anew. And in that hope, we were saved. It is a nice thought because what it does is it gives us hope for a future. When you look around and you see the news or you listen to what's going on in the world, or you, um, let's say it's even as serious as experiencing the death of a loved one. When you experience that death, the Christian can always and forever be of two minds about it. We know that it affects us and we know that it's a terrible tragedy and it can even create depression and sadness and have all kinds of negative outflows from it. And yet the Christian must hang on to hope because as Paul says, in this hope you were saved. Um, anybody see the movie Shawshank Redemption? Yeah. One of my favorites ever. And Tim Robbins' character has a line, I can't remember right off the top of my head, but um, where he's in the prison, but he's, he's talking about hope. They can't take your hope from you. So you can sit in a prison cell, and what you learn at the end of the... I'm not going to give away the movie if I tell you that he tunneled his... <laughs> where he tunnels his way out of the prison, okay, and he gets out. But he talks about having hope. I mean, his hope was a slow developing reality where he finally escaped and then he gets vindicated because he was actually innocent the whole time anyway, but he kept hope the whole time that he was imprisoned. And that would be a mistake also, by the way, folks, is for us to look at life like on this side of heaven as though we're imprisoned and all we have is hope for a future. Um, that actually speaks to something I may or may not have told this group, but forgive me if I repeat myself. Um, several years ago, I was the LWML pastoral counselor for the state of Nebraska, and um, they had held a, um, a convention, and they had different breakout sessions, and one of the breakout sessions was prompted by a suggestion box card that um, a well-meaning person had put a suggestion in. I'd like to have some people come and talk about why they've left the faith, because my kids have left the faith. So in response to that, one of the gals on the board had a sister who had left the faith, and she invited her sister, who was now an atheist, and a bunch of her sister's friends who are part of the Lincoln Atheists group to come be panelists at the LWML convention. And this was all sort of done undercover. So I, I you know, as a pastoral counselor, I go to these things and I sign up for stuff. And I'm like, mm, that's interesting. I'll go to that one first. And I go sit down and, and it's this panel of seven atheists sitting up in front of everybody lecturing these well-meaning LWML ladies about why it's good to be an atheist. <laughs> And it was an hour-long session, and for an hour, they all talked about their experience, why they left the faith, and nobody got to say anything back or have any retort to their claims they're making. I'm going, is anybody going to say anything? Oh, I'm the pastoral counselor. I'm going to say something. So I got up, and I'm like, this aggression will not stand. Big Lebowski, if you're paying attention. And, um, and I'm like, we're not going to let them just sit up here and say that that's their truth and that we should accept it we're going to actually have a chance to have some interaction. So ladies are asking them questions like, well, what, do you, what does an atheist believe when you die? Well, we believe that you didn't exist, then you do exist, and then when you die, you no longer exist and you have no awareness, awareness of it. So that's their belief with death, and it simplifies the complexities of having a, 
a deity or a being that's over them who makes judgment at the time of death. But the thing that struck me most that I, I had to deal with when we were in there was one of the atheists on the panel, he happened to be the secretary of the Lincoln Atheists Club, I still remember. I don't remember his name, but I remember his role. He says, um, we have it better than Christians because Christians have only hope for a life that's yet to come. So they put all their stock and all their hope waiting on that life that's yet to come. But we who are atheists, we get to enjoy life now while we have it. And I'm sitting there and I go, wow, that's, a, that's good. <laughs> that's really good. I felt bad that, you know, like think Romans 8, Paul, in this hope you were saved. You know, for I consider the sufferings of the present time not worth comparing to the glory that will be revealed in us, Paul writes in Romans 8, 18. And I'm going, that's what I've been doing all along. This guy just nailed me to the wall. I should be, I should be living for the now. Which, in reality, that's what the Christian does do and should do. We should live for the now with the eager anticipation and expectation of the future also, Right? So we don't just ignore the present and, and treat it as though it doesn't matter and like he was accusing us of doing. That's not really the way that it works. The way that it works is we can have the fullness and enjoy the fullness of God's creation, which gives him joy to give to us, and it gives him joy to create us, and it gives him joy as we even seek to understand it. I think that made a lot of sense to me for the first time after that whole session was, you know, we can study space, the furthest reaches of space. Um, my mother-in-law's brother has his PhD from Georgetown in astrophysics and worked with the, um, was a civilian contractor with the Air Force for his whole career and worked with astronomers. And all of his colleagues are atheists because they study the stars. And he said, I was the one Christian amongst all kinds of people that just rejected God. And he said, instead of not seeing God in this massive and expanding universe, he said, all I could see was God. Brilliant LCMS Lutheran Christian. Um, one of the smartest guys amongst the smartest guys that I know. And, um, and I think that's the beauty of it is we can take whatever it is that God's built into creation, whether it be the human body when we study physiology, whether it be, you know, the anatomy of a squirrel. <laughs> or, yeah. <laughs> or, or um, you know, the life cycle of an amoeba. Or, you know, whatever you want to study. We can study it, and as we study it and enjoy and find fulfillment in the things of this life, we can give credit where credit is due to the God who made it. And gave it to us as a gift to enjoy. Because it gave him joy to see us enjoy it. I think that's great. And I think um, it gets us looking beyond death and saying, you know what? That's, that's the real beauty of it. Uh, we went to the, to the uh, Arctoberfest last night. And they had a, a couple that was playing um, upa music through the whole thing. They had to bring them down from Wisconsin. Because yeah. <laughs> <laughs> they couldn't find anybody here. Now... Um, a year ago, I'll tell you this, uh, Dr. Harold King that was a member of the church here, he passed away and I did his funeral. I went up to visit him at the hospital when he was, he had COVID and several other complications at the end, but we had two chances to visit in the ICU before he died and then I did his funeral. Lovely guy. I had an, a very enjoyable conversation with him, a couple long conversations, but somehow in the middle of all these conversations, we talked about having an accordion and they did always wanted to play the accordion. And I was telling him my mom, my mom had an accordion, but when um, my grandma died, my uncle and aunt took it before my mom could get their hands on it, because you know what happens when people die. Everybody goes after the stuff. And so I said, I always kind of wanted to learn how to play it, because I thought it'd be fun to play oompa music. Well, then the next day, I got a call from his daughter-in-law, uh, Elka, who was just in church here last week or two weeks ago. And um, she says, Dr. King wanted you to have something. We've been going through his stuff. And she opens up this box, and it's an accordion that's an Italian accordion made of mother of pearl beautiful accordion and she said would you put it on and play a little bit on it and um and uh so i could take the video up and show him before he's gone and so she took some video of me playing on it a little bit and then took it up to him he saw it and he died so yesterday i'm like um man wouldn't it be great if i was any better at that accordion 
but if I had if if I had the moxie to do this, I'd look it up. Maybe I could. I won't bore you with that and waste our time with that. But uh, a year ago, Christmas it was right before Christmas that she brought it to me. I played Silent Night with it and recorded it, and then I put it on my Facebook page. You, you st- you've seen it, yeah. Yeah, my whole family, we, they're all sleeping, and I'm playing Silent Night on it, and I posted it up and wish Merry Christmas. Well, then we were talking about it yesterday at the table. I'm like, man, I wish I could play the accordion. And um, Amy says, we all wish that you wouldn't. Yeah. <laughs> or at least if you did, you did it in the locked room down in the basement. Now, why do I bring all that up? Because I believe in the resurrection. It is a physical resurrection that's promised to us, the hope of the future that's yet to come. I don't know if there will be accordions there. But God gave us the beautiful gift of music, and he inspired musicians over the years. God gave us the, the gift of art. God gave us the gift of dance. God gave, Think of all the things. So yesterday at the, another one at the Oktoberfest, okay, Wendy Platt was there, and I'm walking by, and she saw me. I had full, you know, full later hosing on, and she was there with some friends, and she's like, you're there? Drink. She couldn't believe that I was there, and then like an idiot dressed like, you know, like a German at uh, Hofbrauhaus. Well, then she came up to me later and she says, do you know how to polka? Because my friend here wants to polka. And I'm like, well, sort of. We used to go polka and all the time when we were kids, you know, but we don't have any, you know, sawdust on the nice wood floor to go polka and we're on a street here. Well, my friend wants to polka. So she had her friend stand up and I was polka and with her out in the street. Not very good, but I'd love to get better at it. This is my point. I'd love to have an eternity to sit down with an accordion and learn to play it. I'd love to have eternity to get to be a better dancer. I'd love to have eternity to get to know people, to really get to know people and have conversations with them. I'd love to have eternity to sit down to a nice meal with you or you or you. Think of what eternity means for us and the hope that God sets in the future for us. Now, we can enjoy these things in the now. And I had a great time yesterday. I didn't have a great time this morning when I was hitting the alarm, you know. But uh, I look forward to more times like that. We had a ball. And isn't it fun when we can get together? I mean, think how the church loves to get together for stuff like that. We get together for, we don't do potlucks really anymore. But when the days before COVID, when we would do that kind of stuff, we need to get back to doing some of that stuff because we should enjoy this stuff instead of the world being, you know, always so oppressive over us. So what we find is that death unnaturally separates us from the body from the soul, and it creates all kinds of unnatural outflows of it, right? Jesus attests to this. He says, don't fear those that can kill the body but can't kill the soul. So once again, using our reason ministerially with the scriptures, we read this doctrine that's presented there in the scriptures, which is Christ giving himself to us. And what does he say? He says, don't fear people that can kill your body but can't kill your soul because you're both. And we know that the soul in that interim state goes for the Christian, for the faithful, goes to be comforted by God in his presence as it awaits the day of the revealing of the sons of God, to use Paul's words in Romans 8. Rather, fear him who can destroy both soul and body in hell. Um, So there's a word that fits in with the whole business of we should fear and love God. There should always be a healthy and a reverent fear that we have of this God who created us, but also can wipe us out. I know Bill Cosby is not um, in vogue to quote in church or anywhere for that matter now, given his potential, or I'm not sure of the indiscretions. I guess he was convicted of them. But we used to listen to Bill Cosby tapes all the time when we'd go on family vacations, the, you know, and we had it all memorized, you know. But I'll never forget, you know, he had the one bit that he did with his kids. And he's like, he used to tell his kids, he goes, you know, I'm not afraid to take you out of this world and I'll make another one that looks just like you. You know, and the kids are acting up. Right, right. Yeah, my wife was the goalie or whatever. And she had to kick him back in play. That was her job. And I think of that with God. Like, what's to prevent him from just wiping me out and making another one that looks just like me? Nothing. So what I do then is I conform my life to what he wants so that he doesn't have to do that because I know that he doesn't want to do that. Uh, Another passage that we use for the separation of body and soul is in Luke 12. Um, God said to him, fool, this night your soul is required of you and the things that you have prepared, whose will they be? That's Jesus telling a parable about wealth. 
And that's just a snippet from Jesus telling a parable about wealth. The young man who said, I'm going to build bigger barns and store up more stuff because, hey, eat, drink tomorrow, you know, we die. And fool. Yeah, look at the, yeah, drive down 62 and look at the fools that build bigger barns. Yeah. I always said I didn't know God was Mr. T. Fool. I pity the fool. All right. Um, Jesus, it said, gave up his spirit. When he was there on the cross in Matthew 27 in the account of his death and passion, Jesus cried out again with a loud voice. He yielded up his spirit. Um, So we are created body and soul. Paul attests to it in Romans 7. Wretched man that I am, who will deliver me from this body of death? Thanks be to God through Jesus Christ our Lord, so then I myself serve the law of God with my mind, but with my flesh I serve the law of sin. Um. And then in John 11, Jesus uh, said, Take away the stone. This is Lazarus. Martha, the sister of the dead man, said to him, Lord, by this time there will be an odor, for he has been dead four days. So in both of these passages, we see that this body is corruptible. That's the the, um, result of our sin, that these bodies age, and they corrupt, and they break down, and ultimately they die. Uh, I've often said, you know, theologically speaking, You could make a case for the fact that the clock, which I'm always battling, um, did not come into existence until the curse was leveled. Because death was not the original plan. Death came as a punishment on the heels of the sin of the man and the woman. So God had created us in his image. What is his image? God is eternal. Right? So God created man and woman, body and soul, eternal, in the same image as God. We still bear that image, right? Though it was lost in some degree on account of our sin. But the image is awaiting restoration in its fullness. So the clock, the clock got imposed upon us as a, as, as a result of our sin. God said, now the, t- the clock is ticking. You know, the years of a man's life shall be 70 or by reason of strength 80, as, as Moses writes in Psalm 90. Well, that's... Well, we're body and soul, so we're, we're combined together, unified body and soul. Um, God, as he has revealed himself to people, reveals himself in a way that resembles a man, right? Uh, when people call God our mother, that's an abomination because God presents himself in the scriptures as our father. He's referred to by Jesus as our father. And when you see, like, Times in the Old Testament. Uh, who did I look this one up for the other day when I was on the phone? Uh, Pat, was it you when we were talking about um, the, the pre-incarnate God? Um, in uh, Exodus, the 70 elders of Israel went up and ate with God and beheld him, and they weren't put to death, but they got to see God even before death. God revealed himself to them. And how did he reveal himself to them? As a man, looking like you or me. How did he become incarnate and be born in the flesh as a baby in the same image that we bear when we were born? We were all, we all started off babies. None of us were born full of blown adults. We started off as babies, just like Jesus did. So what I would say is that image, even in our body and soul, the oneness of body and soul, in a way that that's a a mirror image in some ways of the Godhead. And we didn't know the Godhead to be Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, right? All in unity, Trinity in unity, and unity in the Trinity. Um, when God shows himself or reveals himself, even in like the book of Revelation, he's in the, he looks like a man, but he's got features that make him different than a man. So think about Jesus like at the transfiguration. He was still Jesus, but now his face shone brightly like the sun. So he's still a man, He still looks like a man, but there's some differences too because he's God and we're not. I don't know if that's helpful or not. 
it's hard to describe, honestly. Um, did Adam and Eve's first two children, Cain and Abel, and Adam and Eve, for that matter, look different? You know, uh, if you got your Bibles, take a look at this with me, and I'll just show you a quick place to see this. It's Genesis chapter 5. I'll read verses 1 to 3. So, uh, real quick recap. Genesis 1 and 2, creation. Genesis 3, fall. Genesis 4, the story of Cain and Abel. Now Cain kills Abel, right? And then Cain is sent wandering. Now we're to Genesis 5. There's your quick history. And then we pick up at Genesis chapter 5, verse 1. And it says, this is the book of the generations of Adam. When God created man, he made him in the likeness of God. The image. All right? Male and female, he created them, and he blessed them, and he named them man when they were created. When Adam had lived 130 years, he fathered a son in his own likeness, after his image. So what's happening there? This is part of the, the scripture that leads to the doctrine of original sin. So the original sin that Adam and Eve entered into, that became staining for the rest of us that we all inherited from Adam and Eve back to the beginning would be that they were like God in the image of God they were created. And then Satan said, God knows that if you eat this fruit off this tree, you will be like God, which was a lie. So he got them to eat it. And then it says their eyes were opened and they realized their nakedness and they hid themselves and they ran away from God. And they had in that moment lost that image. Uh, several years ago, we had a guy, the backstory is not terribly important, but he was a professor at the University of Toronto of Biblical Languages, and he came to Central City and offered, he was friends with the Presbyterian minister, and he offered the ministerial alliance in town that he would teach his Hebrew primer that he had written while he was on sabbatical. So we all met for classes, and he was using scripture, this is how you learn it, is to just work with it. So he was using scriptures to teach the Hebrew language. And we covered that passage in Genesis chapter 3 where it says, the man and the woman ate of the fruit of the tree and their eyes were opened, is the way it reads in the Hebrew. He says, see, it never said that there was a sin there. It just says their eyes were opened. He says, we reject the doctrine of original sin because it never said they sinned. It just said their eyes were opened. And I'm like, that's when I said, I was hosting the classes and I'm like, hold up. You're not going to teach doctrine in here. You're here to teach us Hebrew, not doctrine. We disagree on that point because we believe in the doctrine of original sin, which is we had the image of God in the beginning, the likeness of God. We lost it as a punishment from the sin, and it's proved out for us in Genesis 5. Well, now as Adam has offspring, the offspring no longer have the image and likeness of God. They bear the image and likeness of their sinful father, which was Adam, which Again, using Scripture to interpret Scripture, we would mesh that up with stuff like Psalm 51, David's psalm that he writes after sinning with Bathsheba. In sin did my mother conceive me. Right? And we would say, oh, well, there's another passage that speaks about how even from the moment of conception, when the sperm met the egg and they divided for the first time, there was a really weak body. It was only two cells as a zygote but it also was a soul at the same time. We've talked about that in here together. And what was it? In the very earliest phase, it was sinful. Okay? And in need of redemption. So that baby, you know, the, the cells continue to divide. It develops into a baby. It's born of the woman, and it's born sinful. Right? And it needs redeeming, so that's why we take it to the baptismal font, and we wash it of its sins, and, um, and Jesus then purchases and wins that child for his own. Are you saying that if, if Adam and Eve hadn't created sin, childbirth could, could be considered even today as part of creation? Absolutely. But, it, but now it can. Well, it's still, it's, I mean, we call it procreation. It's still an act of God that's being done, creation and the formation of life is still something that comes from God. And maybe I'm going up down the wrong path here um, from your question, but the woman was always going to have children. She was designed to have children. That was how God built her, okay, and made her. What it says, if you read Genesis 3, when God's leveling his curses, he says, I will increase your pain in childbirth. 
So you're always going to have it, but now it's going to hurt. The man, it, it also says, you, um, your desire will be for your husband and he will rule over you. That's another way of saying the husband was always intended to be over the man. But now guess what? As a result of sin, you're not going to like it. And men are going to abuse their position of authority over a woman. And they will, and they do, and we know it, and we should repent from it when we do it. And similarly, the woman is going to resent the fact that the man has been made to be over her, which she didn't do before the fall into sin. So therein, these are all examples of how we lost the image of God, because the image of God would be one of perfect obedience, right? That's a part of the image. But we lost perfect obedience when sin came into the world, and now we no longer care about being obedient to God's word. So now the way God discerns the ones who are his children, the ones who love him, the ones who look to his word for truth, are the ones who persist in his truth and stick to it. Again, I don't know if that was answering your question. I went down a, but, but yeah, I mean, it's still part of God's creation. He's using, that's the cool thing about God. He uses his creation in service to his creation. So even think about the, the passing down of the word of God. God doesn't just create and then stand back and go, okay, I'll see how this is all going to turn out. He actually reaches into creation and works through his creation. So he feeds us through the crops in the field and the farmers who work the crops in the field. He teaches through pastors, you know, who come to church and speak his word faithfully. He builds up families through the mother who gives birth, right? He doesn't just go... Brrr. And buzz, and there you go, you get them. You know, go to your portal and receive your child. <laughs> That's a stupid thing, but there's just all kinds of things that God just is always working. And it's, these are first article realities of God. If you guys study your catechisms, you'll see the first article of the Apostles' Creed. Right? I believe in God the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth. What does this mean? I believe that God made me and all creatures. And he gives me all that I need to support this body and life. God is constantly working in this life to give us the things that we need to support not only us, but his whole creation through us. So I don't have to be an engineer, you know, uh, to design a car, but I can still get in a car and drive one to, to church on a Sunday morning because God provided for me through the engineer that designed and built that thing to get me here. I got to stop. Um, but I can't stop without acknowledging that we have a birthday in the room and we have to sing happy birthday. Daryl. 29 again, so happy birthday to you, happy birthday to you, happy birthday dear Daryl, happy birthday to you, God's blessings to you, God's blessings to you, God's blessings dear Daryl, God's blessings to you. See, all right, happy birthday. All right, well.